Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, Annika, and good morning, everyone. And we've already heard you say the word exciting, and it's not often that you hear the word exciting in the same sentence as regulation. <laughs> but I do hope that this session will try to bring some knowledge and uh, understanding of why this is such an exciting time for us. But humbled to follow those two so impressive presentations that we heard earlier, and it really reinforces the challenge that I and my organisation face about supporting science into health. And so what I would like to do in taking you into the world I live in, the regulator's world, is to talk about how that world is changing, enabling as a regulator, rather than being a watchdog or a policeman or some of these more traditional ideas, building on the learnings of the pandemic, then talking about how we are actually delivering innovation, the regulatory approaches, particularly the partnerships we're now fostering, and I think today is redolent with partnerships. And then finally, more important than perhaps any of the other uh, aspects I'll cover, is realising the opportunities of new data, genomic methodologies and regulatory science. Just a brief word of background. Three years ago, the organisation was three very distinct centres. It had been brought together through an initiative of government, but in offices, a regulatory group, in the same office, real world data and data analysts, but not really talking to one another. And in the Greenfield site, as you can see, the bench work, the laboratory scientists, the WHO centre that delivered NOPV2 vaccine, the polio vaccine. Three very distinct centres, synergies, none, virtually none. And so looking into the next slide, at that point, Obviously, leaving the EU had a cause to be thinking again, but many ideas being conceptualised about how regulation could change and could actually play an enabling role, uh, culminating in the life sciences vision where actually that idea started to become hardwired into some plans. And so with this going on in the environment, what thoughts were being had? Of course, the pandemic hit, and that's when the realisation that the UK regulator had the advantage of real world data, had the absolute bench expertise, the prepared minds, Louis Pasteur style on SARS-CoV-2 and MERS, that the preparedness of the environment meant that producing standards for uh, products, for therapeutics, and also for uh, diagnostics was absolutely a natural Hence, the 300 days that elapsed before a, an approved vaccine was first administered in the UK, uh, all of that thinking being brought to bear on that trajectory. But not only vaccines, the flexibilities of not having a locked-in regulator sitting in an office going out to the Nightingale hospitals, actually rethinking some of the guidance on aseptic manufacture, the mindset changing that is our job to enable not to be a, a barrier. And of course, we're going to be thinking more about the diagnostic era that we're now in, the fact that a new deliverable might be a target product profile. When we issued those, they were used worldwide to accelerate access to the diagnostics. So a bit of a trip round memory lane, but all of the above saying that three distinct and separate centres were no longer relevant. One agency launched a year ago with the three main groups, distinct pillars for accelerating science through to healthcare. First of all, enabling innovation, then accelerating access by working in partnership, and finally, the necessary safety net when risky decisions are taken in the context of uncertainty. So this is where we are now, and worth having in mind, because it is the scene that everything else uh, takes place on. So how are we delivering innovation? What is the history here? Regulators around the world have thought of new designations, whether it's breakthrough at the FDA level or indeed in Europe, priority medicines. A designation, but what is a designation if it doesn't lead to something more? Yes, accelerated reviews were done, but what more could be done? And as that concept and that kind of challenge perpetrated our thinking, per penetrated our thinking, we began to look from the previous tried and tested pathway, 
called EAMS, Accelerated Access to Medicine, through to an integrated pathway, an innovative licensing and access pathway. Sounds perhaps a bit arcane, I'm so conscious of the science that's in everyone's minds, but unless those support pathways are there, that science takes a very long time to reach patients, around 10 years. And so we set ourselves the challenge by looking to integrated working with health technology assessment with the NHS to halving that time. So the innovative licensing and access pathway uses innovative approaches, methods and tools, patients involved, patient groups with relevant knowledge and expertise for patient reported outcome measures, for example, better use of real world data, so that there is earlier decision making in the development paradigm. And there is more to do and much more to do with HTA to ensure that we are absolutely hand in hand with the idea, as in Canada, that we issue a regulatory approval on the same day as the HTA approval is given to. So still big challenges, but in the two years this has been operational, we have had around 190 applications, around 90 approved for an innovation passport that leads to this swim lane, the pattern that is well understood in terms of product development, but all done in a bespoke way a target development profile that's carried through in a very iterative manner, no longer disseminating regulatory advice, but a process of supportive dialogue. First innovation passport, Belzutifan for von Hippel-Lindau disease, and that is now an authorised medicine, reaching those patients who have these really unpleasant hemangioblastomas that may lead to malignancy. So we're beginning to see this end-to-end -end pathway truly happening in practice. We're also changing our legal framework. Again, it may seem rather dull after what we've just been listening to, but unless we lead the world in point-of-care manufacture, then the regulatory framework is not there, it's a blank canvas. And we hear again and again from developers that when there is nothing, actually that holds up progress. They need to know the standards and the approaches that a regulator will be thinking about. And so the first worldwide uh, of its kind to put in a legal framework. Does it really matter? Well, yes, because we're moving away from those large scale manufacturing plants into possibly even a single person batch of a product. It may have a very short health life. It may be administered not just in hospital, but in the patient's home. And so we have to be ready to support safety, our prime concern. Does this matter today? Well, yes, it does. Who wasn't entranced to read over Easter about the promise of personalized cancer jabs? Thinking about that question we just heard, what about public dialogue? Which of us who doesn't know someone with a malignancy who's not beginning to think, when will this become standard of care? And maybe coming to a hospital not so far from here, we'll be thinking about how that personalisation can be achieved in practice. What does that mean for a regulator? Why should a regulator even be part of the conversation? <laughs> It's because our regulation, which is geared to a product, a benefit risk in a population, will now be absolutely transformed, disrupted, if you like. We're looking to be, when you see the cycle for personalised immunotherapy, authorising a process, perhaps, not a product. And unless we start setting these standards out, again, where is the NHS and where is the industry? So personalised immunotherapy, relying all those points in the cycle to be in place so that the person, perhaps down at Adambrooks, who's getting a personalised cancer jab, is assured of safety at every step. And again, our support for AI, I'm very glad to see a, an ex-colleague in the room here, has been very much part of our deliverable. Multi-agency advisory service, it sounds so obvious, but I believe, and I'm given to understand, there's no other jurisdiction that is able to offer that 360 with MHRA, NIHR, HTA, everyone coming together to say, what standards do we want to see to assure that a new digital tool or therapeutic will actually do what it says it does? So the coming together, this is why PHG is so important, of the various questions that can be looked at in one place. We heard 
earlier in uh, the director's presentation about the work being done on synthetic data sets. Absolutely vital that the building blocks of our new systems are properly scientifically validated. So where next? And here is the, I think, more exciting part of the conversation. How are we going to be using new data sources? Absolutely putting genomics like a stick of rock throughout regulation and regulatory science, whatever that may mean. So a few minutes on this, if I may. We know since Ben Goldegg delivered his very important report that there is work to be done to be a trusted uh, environment for research. And that work, I'm pleased to say, is ongoing. And the government's response, data saves lives, is absolutely nailing our colours to the mast. We are the guardians of an important data set, the Clinical Practice Research Data Link, and it's, it's a responsibility to make sure that that is used to its absolute fullest potential. Traditionally, our real-world data source, including CPRD, has been used in a really very planned way to conduct epidemiological studies, usually on drug safety signals. And I'm talking here about the regulatory use. It's been really important. We wouldn't have shown pertussis vaccine was safe in the third trimester without carefully planned academic studies. We wouldn't have had the really rather rapid knowledge working with the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine around risks like Guillain-Barre um, or Bell's palsy with the COVID vaccines. So that hand-in-hand -hand approach with academia, but a very traditional utilisation of our data. But now that we're connecting through our monitoring systems, Safety Connect, with patients, our biggest reporter during COVID, that half a million or so reports on the COVID vaccines largely came from patients and the public expressing what they understood about safety to us, starts to open the door for more and more interesting utilisation of data that only patients can give us. So here we have the dimensions of CPRD growing all the time, covering more than a quarter of GP practices now. And the fact that we have perhaps not used it to its fullest extent is one of the big challenges we face. We've heard about the PHG Foundation work looking at synthetic data sets, but what more could we be using this resource for? For example, we have new guidelines looking at how it can be used for regulatory decision making. That previously was really out of bounds. FDA's done some very good work there, but two guidelines, one of our key mechanisms to support innovation, first of all around the use of real-world data for randomised controlled trials, and secondly, importantly, the other complementary guideline on assessing the quality of real-world data. So again, it may sound prosaic, but unless those guidelines are out there, we won't be seeing rapid labelling updates using real-world data, repurposing of established medicines, and using CPRD for rapid recruitment. Another great way of taking time out of development is to use the capability to search the database for research eligible patients. Now, before people get ethically worried, the GP will be in there being able to be the intermediary and saying, you might be eligible, what do you think about it? And that conversation when it's left to the eligible patient to then express an interest seemingly is now one of the ways in which we will help recruitment, sprint, speedy recruitment. And then the representativeness of our data. We believe it's very good, but there's always more to be done, particularly around ethnicity and around socioeconomic status. So some important work there to maximise the utility of the data. Now let's shift the focus to pharmacogenomics. I don't think anyone in this room, at least I hope, will need convincing that we need to do more to unlock the genetic basis of adverse drug reactions. That estimate that around a third could potentially be used, could potentially be reduced if we use pre-treatment genetic testing. How good is that data? And could we actually see this moving into reality? Well, I'm delighted to say, and I know Genomics England, I hope, would say exactly the same thing. We are on the cusp of moving forward to maximising the use of our yellow card data to be able to study in depth through whole genome sequencing 
what those risks are. And I think anyone who listened to the news that neonates would now be tested for gentamicin ototoxicity risk might, might have asked, when was that genetic mutation first discovered? 25 years ago. We've waited 25 years. We shouldn't be having to do that. It should be a systematic approach so that we are then able to translate science into healthcare without unnecessary delay. The PREPARE study, you may have seen in the Lancet, actually showed that preemptive testing, without going into huge detail now using this 12 gene panel, pharmacogenetic panel, would actually reduce the uh, uh, clinically relevant adverse drug reactions by about a third. So proof of that early work now coming through and UK hospitals were involved in this research. And I thank again the whole 100,000 Genomes Project for saying this, uh, sharing this data, fascinating data. 99% of us, practically everyone in this room, probably has one drug gene uh, genetically based uh, uh, link that we might want to know about. So no, no stress there to Genomics England, no pressure. But as we move forward through pilot studies to start to look at a yellow card biobank, the opportunity here to improve healthcare and reduce the pressure on the hospital services is incredible. And all of this in line with that great piece of work and the hats off to the Royal College and to the British Pharmacological Society for setting fair and square in this really good report that the NHS needs to shape up. I don't know if Dame Sally Davis is here yet, but I know she's due to attend. When she said the UK has a cottage industry, I think that struck most of us uh, that something has to be done. It should no longer be a cottage industry. It should be systematic. Finally, when I touch on our own scientific strategy, we're looking to scale up that rather obscure field of regulatory science. What should it be? What can it be to ensure that benefit-risk decisions that we need to make are fully uh, supported by the best available data? And I think the shopping list that the Academy of Medical Sciences prepared in this report does give us food for thought uh, today and food for thought for our partnership with PhD and we will be looking at some nice uh, proposals on those cards later on no doubt. Finally nothing will be done by the UK on its own. We're starting to make strong partnerships with Australia, Canada, Singapore, Switzerland. It's our so-called access consortium of regulators and in particular you saw the guidance no doubt on the strain changes, rapidly supporting industry for the strain changes for the COVID vaccines to deliver what we needed for our booster campaign. And of course, the bilateral work being done with the FDA that has already delivered good machine learning practice guidance for medical device development. So huge progress and all through the application of science to regulation. I had to finish with something slightly more political because we have been given some money and how wisely to invest it. That's why I'm so keen to hear the discussions and the debates today because what the Chancellor has said in the spring statement is we need an agile regulator, we need a, re a regulator that's internationally connected but how much do we need to rely on others for and what are going to be the, if you like, USPs for the UK ecosystem that will attract developers to the UK to make the most of the incredible science that we bring to bear. So here we go. In summary, we are no longer a watchdog. I hope I've convinced you at least of that. We're building very much on the learnings of needing to be agile and proactive. Our focus is on innovation. Now that we're out of the EU, we can be devoting all our energy to the innovations that we in the UK are best placed to uh, introduce and using the NHS as our wonderful learning environment. But the partnerships that will be the basis for this are ours for the making. And in that regard, I only want to say an enormous thank you to PHG. It has been an absolute privilege to work with you over these years and the best is yet to come. Thank you. Thank you.